So, the folks at GearBest.com told me that they were willing to send me anything from their website. And I saw one item that I thought would be really cool. A Super Famicom Classic. You know me, I love those classic systems, and I took a look at the Super NES Classic and I thought that was a fantastic thing. And I really wanted to see what the games were like on the Super Famicom Classic and just see if there was any really big differences. So they sent it, and then it came in. This looks like a Super Famicom Classic, don't it? But it's not, it's something else. Let's take a closer look. The SNES Classic has quickly become an iconic video game system. And I know it's a bit too early for a lot of folks to really accept that, but it has done so well so quickly because it is a fantastic piece of tech. With its built-in list of games that attract a wide range of audiences from hardcore gamers to even just passers-by that loved Nintendo once upon a time, the Classic has proven itself to be one of the best systems you can get, especially if you're looking to play Super Nintendo games on your modern TV. But unfortunately, due to its success, it was only a matter of time for someone to come out and pirate the thing. And of course they did, and here's one of those systems. This is called the Super HDMI Mini Entertainment System, or the Super Mini SFC, it doesn't really matter, because what you're actually dealing with here is something I don't think anyone is ever gonna wanna buy. And if you did, you are in for a very bad surprise. To begin with, when you see the box that this thing comes in, it kind of looks like the Japanese Super Famicom Classic release that was so visually interesting because it was basically copying the same design they released for the original Super Famicom. And this is very iconic, you know, this is the way these things used to look. But what you're seeing on this box is an inverted color scheme. This is the best way to tell that you are looking at a fake system, but they did try pretty hard to make it look fairly close to the original. You'll also notice that there is no Nintendo logo, and to the top right, it says 621 8-bit games. No, 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 not 16-bit, not 32-bit, 8-bit games. Because there is absolutely not one single Super Nintendo game on this system that's supposed to be a Super Nintendo. The only job you've got when pirating one of those SNES classics or Super Famicom classics is to basically steal the video game library from that console and put it on here. But you couldn't even do that because you didn't even copy the right system. What's actually inside of this thing isn't some Super Famicom whatever the heck. No, it's just a cool baby. You know, that system we already looked at in the past. In fact, it pretty much is the exact same game list, only they've just added a couple and shuffled around a few. So what you're looking at here is honestly just a cool baby with a different shell. Cool. Oh, and uh, one more thing that just kind of got me. In the bottom left of this box, it said HDMI 1080p. Now that would have been a pretty amazing feat considering that the official NES and SNES Classic only go to 720p. But this thing here is promising a lot more and it doesn't deliver. When I plugged it up and tested it, all I could get out of it was a 720p image. And unlike the NES and SNES Classic, which presents the proper aspect ratio for the games, this one just stretches out the games on your screen. I really, really don't want to play this console, but you know what? We're gonna do it, folks. You and me, we're gonna sit down and we're gonna beat this whole thing because we need to make sure that this never happens again. If in the future they ever make a Nintendo 64 Classic, there's no way that people will accept NES games being bundled into it. So this officially could mark the final time we ever see anything like this. Unless, of course, Somebody starts producing many tries on 64 and Haku's another cool baby system. We don't know names. All the NES rounds, 64 rooms, confusing the general public and possibly confusing younger consumers who wouldn't know the difference anyway. But that wouldn't happen, right? So as you might imagine, this console is very light and very hollow. I really don't know too much about what's inside here and I'm not even gonna bother opening it up because I'm just quite certain it's very similar to what you would have found in a cool baby. The only difference with this one is like I said, you've got HDMI out and this one powers with a USB micro cord. And just like the cool baby, the very front uses those same COM ports you'd find on a Sega Genesis or even something like an Atari. Now you wanna know why that COM port is such a bad idea? Well, the controllers that are actually bundled 
world with this system suck. And the biggest problem is if you actually own a real NES or a real Super Nintendo controller, you can't actually plug them up to this thing because they're not compatible. I would have actually allowed this to just be a pass if this system had some kind of Bluetooth connectivity in it, but it doesn't have that either, so the whole thing just falls apart. Where do you even get COM ports anymore? I would have preferred two USB imports at the front so I could plug up generic game pads into it. But no, 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 no. We got to use the controllers that are bundled with this thing. You know, the controllers with the terrible D pads and more buttons than you need because even though it's a Super Nintendo controller, these are still NES games. So you're only actually using two of the face buttons to the right and you're never going to touch the shoulder buttons. And there's a big reason why. The L and R buttons and the Y and X buttons are just turbo buttons for the B and A buttons on the face. You see, all that means is when you push those buttons down, they push the other buttons a lot. And that doesn't work with every single game, because for some games those buttons might be jump or whatever it may be. And although they're nice to have, the L and R buttons shouldn't have been turbo. They should have just been the regular ones. That way it would have just been so much easier to use them. But even if you could use them, they're super clicky and not in a good way. They almost feel like they're full-on function buttons that were created to turn on a TV and not to play video games. And to make things even worse, what they did was they actually used the BNA buttons on the SNES controller as the same BNA buttons you would get on an NES controller. But that doesn't work because on an SNES controller, they're laid out different. So now you have to hold down A for Mario to run and B for him to jump, meaning that your thumb has to be in an inverted angle, which feels very, very wrong when you're holding a Super Nintendo controller. But Shane! What? What? If it uses a COM port, why don't you just use the Sega Genesis controller or perhaps an Atari controller? Well, of course we tried that, but it didn't work. Don't you think I would have done that? No, I had to go through 621 games using this piece of crap. Couldn't have been that bad. No? Well, just watch. I'm already having really bad flashbacks of the cool baby because we've got a whole set of games here that are broken up into categories. Action game, shoot game, sport game, fighting game, racing game, and puzzle game. And I'm pretty sure that character isn't from any puzzle game I know. So the very first game we tried out is Super Mario Brothers 3. Hey, look at this. It's actually missing the word Super Mario from the title screen. In fact, we're not actually playing that game. We're just playing three. You know that game three. It's everyone's favorite three. This is stupid. Did you honestly think Nintendo wouldn't sue you just because you took out the word Super Mario Brothers? And, and, well, wait a minute. Why does Mario's skin look ghost white? That's not how he looks in the original release. It almost feels like Casper the Friendly Ghost has squeezed himself into Mario's clothing and he's trying to basically save the princess, which is weird. Okay, you got me curious now. Let's take a look at Super Mario Brothers 2. Well, look at this. It's the same game. Nothing's changed. That's weird. Why would you change three but not two? That's just bizarre. And some games are bound to repeat from the original Cool Baby. Super Mario Brothers 10 Kung Fu Mario is on here, which is just a rip off of a Jackie Chan fighting game. And then Super Mario 16, which is a rip off of Joe Mac is on here as well. The only difference really is that you've got an HDMI cable on here. So the image is slightly cleaner, but whatever. They're still made up games that don't exist and they don't play very well. So cool, that's a feature you got now. So here's another game called Super Chinese. Now in North America, this game goes by the name Kung Fu Heroes, and it actually has some really cool sound effects technology that's used within it to make it sound like people are actually punching. But what's really funny is though the game seems to run fine in every instance, the only thing that seems to be broken is the music. Once in a while, the music just stops working and then you don't hear anything but the sounds of people grunting, which is just a little awkward. Now, a perk to this system is that you may find a duplicate game that actually was a different version that was released somewhere else. In this instance, we're looking at Arbanu Tengu, which I definitely butchered the name of. This game is probably not familiar to you unless you've played Zombie Nation in North America on the NES, because these are the exact same game. Only one features a bit more of a prominent Japanese focus, and the other one is a giant floating zombie head, which I guess is more appropriate for North America because they probably don't know what a Tengu is, but regardless, I don't think this is a really great thing to have too much because it actually is padding out your game list. 
So that whole number of 621 games becomes a whole lot smaller when you consider that they're going to be duplicating games, including games that are exactly the same in Japan as they were in North America. But did you think that was all you were going to see? Official games just recreated in weird ways for this system? No, no, no. There's original games on here, or at least from some developer I've never heard of. This is Abscondi. Now before we analyze that really freaky looking jelly bean thief in the center, let's talk about the music. Just, just have a sample of this. Ah, yeah, my ears are bleeding. What are those notations? What kind of structure is that? I don't even think they know what music is. As soon as you start up the game, Mr. Jellybean turns purple and he starts running around the maze collecting little balls that are multiple colors, I guess. Look, the game isn't very good. And in fact, it's not even the first time I've seen it. I've seen it on multiple versions of these bad consoles. And this one specifically stands out because I just hate the way that it has these little blades that are just propellers that hurt you and they're in the maze for no reason and I have no idea how to get around them. And Mr. Jellybean there looks like a serial killer. Look into those eyes. He's seen stuff and he's done worse. Okay, let's try something a little less frightening. This is Happy Island, which is at, oh, it's, it's actually Adventure Island. It's Area 5 from Adventure Island. I guess you can't really play the beginning of the game, but Adventure Island isn't so bad, so at least you get to play some of it. Right? Let's try something else fun. How about some Hello Kitty? That should bring a smile to my face. Oh no. No. www.touchgameplayer.com They've modified this game. Look at this. It even says loading. There's no loading on this system. What you're seeing there is actually like the pre-title card for a company or something. And they've actually hacked it and put in a loading screen. They've actually hacked it so that you have to look at something that says loading just so you can see their stupid website. So whatever this game actually is, is completely modified in some way or another that makes it unplayable. You never know what they did, so you can't trust the game running the way it was supposed to run. And although this does look like Hello Kitty, which was a release only in Japan, it's gonna stay that way because, well, it doesn't play very good, and I'm not even certain if that's originally how it played. Up next is Chica number 18? I, I don't know what this is. And the game looks like it's broken as soon as it starts up because the text is just flying all over the place. As far as I can tell, this is definitely an Eastern European game that comes from somewhere. I can't identify the font. This game is very boring and it has the worst sound effects. Just listen to this guy walk around. It gets really annoying when that's all you hear and you have to walk around a lot to solve these puzzles. And again, this is a game I've seen on other bad systems as well, only it seems to run even worse on this one, which just seems impossible. But you know what's even more impossible? The fact that they have a copy of FIFA 2006 on here. How? How do you even have that? There's no way this system could be running that, and of course it isn't FIFA 2006. But this is what really confuses me. If this is a pirated system and all they're trying to do is scam people into buying it, why would you choose FIFA 2006? That game is over 10 years old. Who are you trying to scam? What gamer out there is like, oh boy, I better buy this because I gotta play myself FIFA 2006. That person doesn't exist. And if somebody out there did want to play FIFA 2006, they would at least remember that they never played it on the Super Nintendo. Okay, let's try Super Adventure and <laughs> hey look, it's another random stage from Adventure Island. Uh, hey, I, I almost thought this was something original. You, you almost got me, but it's not. It's just a random stage from a game. Good, that, that was smart of you. Good. All right, I'm starting to lose my focus here, but, but let, let's get into it. Let, let's play a game I know I like. This here is Smash TV, and I know I like Smash TV because I used to play it all the time on a real NES, and this seems to be the exact same ROM. Now, one of the cool features of this game when it was released on the original NES is that they wanted to replicate the feeling of playing it in the arcades with two joysticks. So when you take two controllers, you get to use one D-pad as your movement and the other as your aiming and firing. And it works quite well, at least it did on the original hardware, but on this one, it sucks because the D-pads are trash. I really, really thought that this was gonna be an easy win for this system because I feel personally that Super Nintendo controllers are easier to hold sideways, but nope, nope, it's worse. It somehow is worse. I am just... 
Pocket Monster. Look, it's a game I think we've talked about before, but I never really got into it that much. But this time around, I was like, hey, let's, let's just give it a shot. Let's see what happens. So this is a game where you play as Pikachu and a platformer and rocks hurt you. You know why rocks hurt you? Because science, science, that's why. And like I mentioned earlier, it's really difficult to hold this controller in the right way that you're supposed to. So sometimes you'll accidentally hit the turbo button. And when you do, Pikachu runs off the screen and he just gets it's hurt instantly. Everything basically hurts you in this game, so you ain't got a chance to survive. This is just, oh, it, it actually was, you know what I'm gonna say? I'm gonna say, this is better on the cool baby because at least the cool baby has the right button layout. I don't, I don't know how the cool baby is better than this, but it is. Okay, let's try another game. Let's try uh, Hot Boy. That sounds weird, but let's see what it is. <laughs> Of course, it's Adventure Island again. Oh, really? 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 Oh my, why? Why are you doing this? Why do I keep getting Adventure Island? I I'm getting really confused here. And to add on to that confusion, here's Gun Knack. And at the very beginning, it says loading, which it shouldn't because this doesn't have a loading screen. What they've done is they modify the intro screen again. Well, who is it? Who keeps going through these games and adding loading screens? Wouldn't you just remove the intro screen altogether instead of actually just having a fake loading screen? The name that they removed at the beginning there was Nexoft a company that hasn't actually made a game since the early 90s. Ooh, ooh, oh, they're gonna come back from the dead to haunt you and sue you into the ground. Well, how about all the other companies you're ripping off? How about all them? Y you seem not to care too much about one game or the other. What, what made this company so scary that they needed a loading screen put at the front? Jeez. Here's another game called Crypt Car. Do you know what this is? It's actually Dig Dug, only they've modified the main character from Dig Dug to look like a car. Cool, I guess. They've also done a little bit of modification in the enemies and stuff like that, but one of the funniest things is when the main character goes to the center of the screen, they play this little piece of music. It's really nice, but in this game, they modified it like this. Why did you do that? You know when you're playing Dig Dug, the character moves around and when he does, it plays music? Well, that music has stayed completely the same. It's like they lack the skill and talent to modify the game that much. Only just enough to make it look weird, I guess. Okay, next up is Cross Pacific and... <laughs> look, look, it's Adventure Island again. Why, why do they keep doing this? Sure, it's not the exact same Adventure Island game, but they do keep changing the name and just choosing different random levels from each of the entries of the series. Uh, they gotta stop this. There's no reason to do this. On the box of this console, it says they don't duplicate games, and that's a lie, because they do. They keep doing it to this one again and again and again. All right, let's try Blink 3. I've never played one or two, but wh what the heck? Let's give it a shot. It did. Ooh. Ooh, this is just Super Mario Brothers on some weird trip. Mario, what did they do to you? You look so strange. And what's going on in the world? What is all this? Why are all these people here? What are those aliens doing in those tubes with their hands? I don't, okay. Nope, we're, we're taking a break from that one. I don't want to continue on this one at all. Uh, let's try this. Blink Ultra Hard? Maybe that's the prequel and... Oh, yeah, oh, it's the prequel, all right. Oh, the aliens are back in the tubes again. And everything just looks just as weird, but maybe slightly better? I, I don't know. Is this better than Blink 3? Where's Blink 2? How come they just jump to the third one? Is there a reason for that? Is there a reason why they keep modifying the exact same level again and again? I don't think I'm ever gonna know. This game here is called Amusement Park Jumping Kid. Oh, I know, I know. You hear jumping, you automatically think it's gonna be some very interesting platformer. <laughs> You'd be wrong, because this is the worst jumping mechanics I've ever seen in a game. Yeah, you jump over stuff, but that's all you do. That's the whole game, jumping over things again and again and again and again. And what's really funny is that even though Super Mario Brothers had to have come out before this game, they didn't learn from that game at all and made something that was so stilted and poor controlling that you just have to scratch your head and wonder why. Now this game here is called Formation Z. Now Formation Z only came out in Japan on the Famicom and a couple of other systems, and to my knowledge, never came out anywhere else. So by looking at this game, you might assume that, well, this is what the game looks like. But actually the original game, you're a big giant robot that turns into a flying ship once in a while. And in here, you're a wizard and you turn into a dragon. 
Somebody out there had to do that for some reason, and I have no idea why. Everything else about the game seems to be identical. It's just really bizarre. This game is called Boar Forest B. Forest B. Forest B. I, I can't, I can't, I can't do that. Anyway, the, are you? it's Adventure Island again! <laughs> Why? This is called Shadow Warriors, but you may also know it by its other name, Ninja Gaiden. And if you look at the title screen, you can see that stupid website again, which means that something's been modified. And of course, as soon as you start up the game, the music is playing way too fast. This is a big problem, because even if you recognize a game that's on here, likely there's something wrong with it one way or another. And this system is just filled with a bunch of games you may recognize, but have been modified, like Tension Tetris, which to me looks exactly like the original, but there's that website again. It's just hiding there in a bunch of places just to basically mess up your day. All right, let's play uh, Hellfire. At the <laughs> okay, let's try a different one then. Uh, Crash. Crash. Yeah, I've never heard of that before. Uh, Walt Disney's Crash. Oh, there's that dumb website again. Copyright 2011. What is this? Oh no, it's the Jungle Book. It's the Jungle Book and Mowgli has been turned into Crash Bandicoot. He's all rubbery and thin looking and uh, it's too, uh, This is way too creepy. And you know what makes it worse? The story elements from the original game are still there. So you get stuff like this. Crash begins his journey through the jungle to find the Man Village. Why? Why would Crash Bandicoot be looking for the Man Village? Why would any animal in the jungle be looking for any village that has men? They would likely hunt them down and kill them. And if any human being saw this animal thing running around, they would be in their right to do it. Now, speaking about the Jungle Book, a story all about a little kid that's lost in the wilderness, this is Forest Kid. Not the same thing at all, really. No, this kid is just running around saving, I think, monkeys, and then avoiding men that want to shoot him. Because apparently that's what they would want to do when they see a small child. So there, that's a thing. There's probably a really interesting narrative to this, but we'll, we'll never hear about it. Lost in some kind of forest somewhere, a small little boy oh, must run yeah. through the forest and find monkeys that have been tied up because they ran away from, like, a circus or something. And the people that own the circus have guns, and they're chasing you down, and, and it's become a really big thing. And unfortunately, the kid, well, he, he ran away really quick, and he didn't put on all of his clothes, so I guess he just lives in the forest now. That's a thing. That's the story of the game. Thanks, to everyone, for playing. Um, all of that was pretty stupid. Let's go back to the games. Hey, look everyone, it's an unlicensed Spider-Man game. And how does it control? Badly! Real badly. You know how bad it is? I don't even really know how to make Spider-Man climb up the walls. The control scheme just doesn't seem to work and eventually when you do figure it out, you get to a certain level and then the green goblin just starts throwing bombs at you, which doesn't work because you don't have an attack against him and it's nearly impossible to avoid them. Simply wonderful. But you know what would make an unlicensed Spider-Man game even better? Making a sequel to that unlicensed Spider-Man game called Spider-Man 2. Now the gameplay in this one isn't like the previous. All you have to do here is avoid Doc Ock and his projectiles that he shoots around every so often, and you have to attack him by farting web bubbles at him. Now you heard me right. Sometimes if you get really close to him, you have rapid fire fart bubbles that hurts him just that much faster. But what makes the entire experience just hurt me so much more was that in no time at all I realized that at some point I was looking for another enemy or something else to happen so I played through over 20 stages of this game 20 stages of the exact same thing again and again and I didn't stop because by this point I was starting to have serious problems with this console okay I, I gotta reel myself back in and play something I'm very familiar with so let's try Pac-Man 3 Pac-Man 3 there's a third Pac-Man game? Oh, okay, let's give this a shot. Okay, the speed's off, the controls don't work very well, and oh look, Pac-Man has eyes! How pleasantly freaky! And when I got to the second stage and got one of the power pellets to eat one of the ghosts, when they had to, you know, turn into little floating eyes and go back to the center to respawn, well, this one didn't, it just got lost and kept circling again and again and again. But at least Pac-Man 3 had one thing going for it. The stages were changing. And those stages, even though some of them were a little broken, were fun to traverse and fun to explore. That is, until I got here. Look at this, it's a broken stage. Oh, I know, a couple of you hardcore gamers out there 
there probably assuming that I'm really good at Pac-Man and I got to the kill screen. But no, that's not what happened here. This is just four minutes into Pac-Man 3. Eventually the game just got stuck here. And even though you could still play, eventually Pac-Man does get locked up in an area and he can't move out of it. This has the hope and the promise of an interesting Pac-Man game, but it just fails to deliver. All right, let's give this console one more chance. We're gonna try out a game called King Return and <laughs> yeah! ah! done, finished, completed, no more, I'm out. So it's final thoughts time. And I know a lot of you out there are going, well, what good could you possibly say out of this? And you know what, folks? There is some good. For one, even though it says on the box that it is a super Famicom classic, it's not. It's a lie. This is the Cool Baby 2. And I know there's a couple of you out there, you sick puppies, that like the first one enough that you would get a sequel. Well, here it is. This is better than the original Cool Baby because, well, the controllers are slightly rounder, which is easier on your hands, even though the buttons still suck and most of the buttons are just duplicated. And it does have an HDMI video out, which makes a slightly cleaner signal, despite the fact it warps the image. Outside of that though, this is a better system than the original, but not by much. In many cases, it's added a lot more games that have seemed to get worse as time has gone on. You not even know how you do that. And also, the little rubber feet on the bottom. It's great because they actually leave a streak of black ink on your counter when you're reviewing the system, which doesn't come off no matter how much turpentine you use to try and wipe it. Look, I don't think anyone should be buying these. But if you have to, at least know what you're getting into. At least know the nightmare that's about to start. At least understand that once you play this, there's no going back.